Let the people of God say amen. It is indeed a privilege to be in the house of the Lord just one more time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have worshipped, we have praised, and as we continue into this worship, to the presentation of the word, I ask that you would simply use me as you see fit to deliver your word to your people. And as we have been studying the book of James, let us do what the scripture says, and not only being hearers of the word, but doers also. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. There was this pastor. Uh, he had pastored at this church for 30 years, and he was getting ready to retire. And so, of course, after 30 years of service, the church wanted to do something for the pastor. And so they got this committee together. They called it the Retirement Committee. And they worked on everything, and basically what they settled on, they said, we're going to have a one-month retirement celebration. This is a month-long celebration. They had block parties. They had picnics, banquets. And what they decided is, on the last two weeks, there were two young pastors that were very important in this pastor's life. He had, they were like sons to him. He had mentored them. And they decided, well, what we'll do is we will have these two men come in on those last two Sundays and we'll have them preach for the pastor. We'll have them deliver a message and say some good and some encouraging words to our pastor. Now, the interesting thing about these two men is that they weren't terribly similar. One of the uh, pastors, he had a degree a master's of divinity degree, and a doctorate of ministry from Princeton Theological Seminary. The church that he pastored was a large church, and it was a very influential church. Influential and powerful people went to that church. Now, the other pastor, he did not have a master's of divinity degree. He had a bachelor's degree in Christian leadership from a small Bible college. And even though at the time he was pursuing a master's, of, a master's degree, it was not a master's of divinity. It was a master's in practical ministry. And of course, in the seminary world, the master's of divinity degree is the premium degree. And of course, he wasn't pursuing that. The church that he pastored was not a small church. It was a decent sized church, but it wasn't an influential church. It was a blue collar working class church. And that was the individual that they invited to come first. So he comes and they, they're cordial and nice to him. He, he comes in. It was a Sunday evening service. So he comes in that evening. And when he pulls up in the parking lot, there's someone waiting to greet him. They take him to the pastor so that they could sit down and talk. Service starts. He delivers a, a very good and powerful sermon. He says some very kind words about his mentor, they take up a love offering for him. And it is a very, it's a generous love offering. And then they send him on his way. So a week is going by and the committee is preparing for the second pastor. But they decide, you know what, because of who he is and because of everything that he's involved in, we can't simply just have him come in on Sunday evening. So what they do is they invite him to come in Saturday. And they hold a big reception for him when he comes in on that Saturday. And he's invited over to some of the members' houses that evening. They even assign a specific person to him to make sure that all of his needs are taken care of while he's there. When the time for the service comes, somebody comes and picks him up and drives him to the church, shows him into the pastor's office and... He sits and he talks with the pastor. He comes out. He preaches also a very powerful message. He also has some very kind words to say about his mentor. They take up a love offering. Again, it is a very generous love offering. But when the trustees are in the back counting it, one of them says that this is not a sufficient love offering for a man of his stature. And so what they do is they get out the church checkbook and they say, well, how much is the love offering? And they write a check for the exact same amount so that they can give him a double 
portion. And they send him off. Well, that Monday comes, and the deacons and the retirement committee are meeting in the afternoon talking about the events that have passed, and their pastor comes in. He has a very disappointed look on his face. One of the deacons says, Pastor, is there something wrong? And he takes his time and he looks into the faces of every individual in that room. And he says, God has blessed me to pastor this church for 30 years. And it has been a blessing. But I have to say, in 30 years of service, I have never been more disappointed than I am today. I had hoped that as we studied together, as we learned together, as we grew in faith together, that we would have learned that as Christians, we do not show favoritism. But you have both of my sons in ministry who came and who preached a message for you, and one of them you treated well. I'm not, I don't want you to think that I think you mistreated him. You treated him well, but he didn't have the degree from Princeton. He didn't pastor the big church. He didn't know the influential and powerful people. And so when my other son in ministry comes, not only do you treat him well, you show him a great deal of favoritism. There's a reception for him. You assign someone to him to take care of his every need. And both of my sons in ministry preached powerful sermons, but yet when the one leaves, he leaves with two times what was given to the other one. And why does that happen? That happens because you looked at him and you saw a Princeton graduate. You looked at him and you saw a pastor of a big church. You looked at him and you saw someone of power and influence. That's favoritism. And God doesn't have favorites. And neither should we. And with that, he turned around and he simply walked out of the door. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, brothers and sisters. The fact that God does not have favorites. We're going to look at what our brother James has to say about favoritism. Our text today is coming from the book of James, second chapter, first through the 13th verse. Could you please stand as we read? I will be reading from the New International Version. James chapter 2 verses 1 through 13 and it reads, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Your meeting wearing a goat, some, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin. If you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. For whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. 
because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. Favoritism. How many ways do we show favoritism? There are different types. There's economic favoritism. That's what James was talking about in the first part of the text. It's showing favoritism to somebody because of stuff. It's showing favoritism to someone because they have more means than you have. It's showing favoritism to that person simply because they have the car or the house or the clothes or the jewelry. And that's the type of favoritism that a lot of times when we talk about favoritism comes to people's mind. Economic favoritism. It's not all, though. There's favoritism based on culture and social groups. Favoritism based on a person simply because of what family they come from. Favoritism based on somebody because of what organizations they are members of. Favoritism based on somebody because they come from the same cultural background that you do. That's favoritism based on physical appearance. Let's just face it. Good looking people have people be nice to them because they're good looking. I mean, if, if we're going to be honest, that happens. People are nice to attractive people because they're attractive. And then there's religious favoritism. Favoritism, are you a Christian? Yes, okay, well, we'll show a little bit of favoritism. Are you a Baptist? Okay. Are you an American Baptist? Are you a Kansas American Baptist? There's all sorts of different ways that favoritism can be shown, but the bottom line is, and this is, if you don't take anything else away from the sermon today, this is the bottom line. It comes in the very first scripture that I read. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you believe in God, do not show favoritism. It's very first, he starts, James starts off with it. Don't show favoritism favoritism. Problem is, that's hard. Why is it hard? Because it's a part of our nature. It's a part of who we are to do that. And a lot of times what happens, if you think about some of the times in your life you've showed favoritism, and don't say, well, I've never showed favoritism, because you have. If you think about the times in your life when you've done it, if I, if I think about the times in my life when I've done it, sometimes we do it unconsciously. We do it without even thinking about the fact that we do it. But that is not an excuse. So, well, you know, I really didn't think about that I was doing it, so it doesn't count. Sin is still sin. Why does that happen? Well, Paul tells us why it happened. And in his letters, Paul talks about the sinful nature. Remember hearing that Paul talking about the sinful nature and he's saying that there there are natures that are dueling against each other. There's that sinful nature and part of that sinful nature is the showing of favoritism. And then there's the spirit and they are constantly fighting with each other. It's a Paul says it's a daily battle. You, you battle, you go to sleep, you wake up and the battle starts again. Sinful nature, spirit, sinful nature, spirit. And we get to determine who wins. And every once in a while, that sinful nature wins. Every once in a while, that favoritism creeps in. But again, bottom line, if you believe in Christ, if you are one of his, we don't show favoritism. Why? Well, first of all, favoritism is unjust. And I'm saying unjust and not unfair. Because I'm going to say something that might shock you. Understand that God's not concerned with our concept of fairness. Let's say that one more time. God is not concerned with our concept of fairness. Because when you think about what we think to be fair sometimes, it's kind of warped at times. What God is concerned with is justice. Our God is a just God, and he is concerned with justice, and favoritism is unjust. How? 
Well, let's look at the story that John gives us in the beginning of the text when he's talking about the poor man and the rich man. They, this, this man, he basically comes in, he pulls up into the parking lot. He's driving the brand new Rolls Royce. He gets out and he's got on this $1,000 suit with a $1,000 pair of matching shoes. He has a ring on each finger and a beautiful necklace around his neck. His wife is walking next to him and she is impeccably dressed. And he comes in the front door and everybody is treating him so wonderfully. And right behind him walks in a homeless guy. Shabby clothes, probably doesn't smell the best. And what does James say that church does? He says, you shower all of this attention on the rich guy. And the poor guy, you say, okay, you stand over there. If you want, you can sit on the floor. Because, well, you know, we, we have our nice seats here. We don't want, you know, you might leave the smell behind. That's unjust. It is unjust to say simply because the, this one person has all of these trappings of life, all of this pretty stuff that we're going to show him all of this attention and then the least of them we ignore. It's unjust. That's why we don't show favoritism. Look at the story that I told. You had these two men, they come in, they are both men of God, they are both pastors. They both come and they preach the word of God to God's people. And one leaves with a very nice love offering, but the other one, wait a minute, hold on. He's got a degree from Princeton, two of them. And he pastors a big church and very important. Doesn't the governor go to his church? Important people go to his church. We can't leave him, allow him to leave here with this measly offering. Let's go into the church treasury and write something extra for him because God knows we could never do that. But they both did the same thing. But we show favoritism to the one person simply because of who they are. That's unjust. And I wish that I could stand here and tell you that, well, that's what happens in the world, but it doesn't happen in Christian circles, but you all are too smart to know. You know that that's not the case. It happens all the time in Christian circles. I can remember a time we were having a conference back in Detroit, and I'm not going to tell you the evangelist name but he's well known and we had seats set up and he came in and he looked around and he said you need to take some seats out of here we're like why he says because if you take some seats out when everybody fills in it's going to look it's going to look like it's more full than it is i i don't want to preach in a place where it looks empty He's a well-known, well-known preacher. And he came and everybody fawned over him. Oh, oh, pastor, oh, reverend, I, oh, we love you. Can I buy your book? Can I buy your t-shirt? Can I? All of this. And the preacher that came on after him was a local guy, a local preacher, preached at a very small church in the inner city, maybe 80 members. And he preached a sound, biblically based message, and it was it was wonderful. And after and, and after it's over, I couldn't wait to talk to this individual. But everybody's over here with the other guy, who yeah, he was okay. I'll be totally honest with you, he wasn't bad. He was okay. But the message that th that this local guy gave was much better. But everybody is showing, and, and these are Christians. They're all showing favoritism to this one guy because. He's well known, he sells books, he sells t-shirts, he makes movies. It's unjust. Another reason God doesn't want us to show favoritism is because favoritism is rooted in selfishness. It's rooted in selfishness. A lot of times we show favoritism because it, we get something out of it. 
When you look at social favoritism, cultural favoritism, when you look at favoritism based on our religion, what it is is we are favoring people who are like us. We are favoring people who think like us. We are favoring people who talk like us, who look like us, who believe like we believe, and that makes us feel comfortable. Don't want to step out, you you know, I got that group over there. We have, in Detroit, we have a large Sikh population, and, and Sikhs, are they're Indians, but they, they wear the turbans and, and, and they look different and it's uncomfortable. And so I, I'm going to favor this group over here because they look like me. They sound like me. They act like me. I'm not going over there to the people that wear the funny things on their head. It's selfish. We're going to be where we feel comfortable. Let me tell you something. I've read the Bible from beginning to end. And nowhere in it does Jesus say, thou shalt be comfortable. He says, go. He says, make disciples. But he doesn't say, go make disciples in places where you're comfortable. Another thing is, when, when you look at that selfishness, the whole reason that people cater to people who have money who cater to people who have power is because in the back of their mind they're thinking there is a possibility that I can get something out of this relationship with this individual. Again, think about it. You know that this is all honest, hard truth. I've done it myself. But here's the problem with that. The more that you think that you can get something out of a relationship with somebody, the more likely you are to be willing to compromise your principles. And that's dangerous. Same church that I talked about earlier. And most churches have that. We're lucky in that um, most of the people in this church, th th this isn't one of those generational churches. And what I mean by generational churches, there are some churches where there are generational families. The great great grandfather laid the cornerstone for the church. And then the, the great aunt founded the first choir and all of that. And what happens in those churches is usually you have one, maybe two families that are very influential within the church. It isn't even a matter of money because this particular family in this church was not a rich family, but they were influential because the family had been there forever. And because if of all the connections and cousins and, and, and great uncles and all of that, if the, if everybody who was connected to that family left the church, they would have lost about a third of their congregation. So when this family would come and ask for things, oh, sure, we'll give you that. Well, can we get this? Oh, sure, we'll give you that. Well, how about this? Oh, sure. Well, one day one of the family members comes and he asks for something that would totally have gone against Christian principle. And so the church leadership came and they got together to have a meeting. Now, here's the problem with the meeting. They weren't talking about, well, this is what they want. This is Christian principle. This is what the Bible says. This is what God teaches us. That wasn't the conversation. The conversation was, well, if we don't do what this particular person is asking, how will it negatively affect the church? Is this person a powerful enough person within that family that they could sway other people within the family? Compromising principle. That's dangerous. And it's something that we can't do. And that is why God is saying, don't show favoritism. Don't show it because favoritism is rooted in selfishness. Don't show it because favoritism is unjust. Favoritism is also basically a sin. What does it say in our text? In, in verse 8, it said, If you do as the Bible says, if you do unto others as you would do unto yourself, that is good. Then the very next verse says what? It says, If you show favoritism, it is a sin. I mean, right there in black and white. If you show favoritism, you sin. 
and you are convicted by the law. And, and what James is trying to say there, I'm pretty sure there were some people in there that knew the law. And they were saying things like, well, you know what? I don't commit adultery. You know, I'm not a murderer. I, I don't do any of those things, so I'm okay. In the eyes of God, sin is sin. It's not, he's not like us. Because what we do is we compartmentalize and categorize. There's uh, big sin, there's medium-sized sin, and there's small sin. No, God says sin is sin. No big, medium, small. Sin is sin. And favoritism is a sin. Why is it a sin? Because when we show favoritism, what we fail to do is to show God's love. Rich guy over here, you know, we'll take care of him and make sure he has everything that he wants. Poor guy over here, I'll get to you in a minute. I got to go talk to rich guy. And we, you know what we can do? We can even make excuses for it. Poor guy, I'm not paying attention to you because rich guy has money and I'm trying to get money from rich guy so I can take care of you. So just hold on just a minute while I go get money from rich guy to take care of you. And be grateful for it. <laughs> We're not showing God's love. And that's why favoritism is a sin, because we fail to show God's love. The bottom line with favoritism is that when we show favoritism, what we do is we damage our ability to witness for God. And... One of the main things that we are to do when we accept a life with Christ is to be his witness. Be his witness through the way, not only that we speak, but through the way that we live. And if I'm busy over here showing all of this favoritism to this one person and not to this person, what I've done is I've damaged the witness. And what people don't realize, I've damaged the witness for both individuals. I've damaged the witness for the person that I'm ignoring because what you hear, what you're going to hear is, yeah, there those Christians go again, bunch of hypocrites. But you're damaging the witness for the person that you're showing favoritism to because what happens is you are not holding them to account when you should hold them to account. That's not good. We're damaging our witness. When we show favoritism based on our social and our culture, we're damaging our witness. When we show religious favoritism, we're damaging our witness. Let's go back to our church. They eventually got a pastor. They didn't hire either one of those guys. They eventually got one, though. And one day he's walking through the welcome center in the church. And you got this group over here talking with themselves and you got this group over here and they're talking with themselves and a group back here is talking with themselves. And then he looks over in the corner and he sees a husband, a wife and a child. And it's obvious that this group is hurting. And they're over there in the corner and this group's still talking with themselves. Don't even notice this group's still talking with themselves. They, what are they doing? Again, they're show, they, I'm comfortable. Some may have even noticed, but you know what? I don't want to go over there because it might get messy. Go back to Casey Van Norman. Life's messy. And I don't want to go over there because it might get messy. So I'm going to stay over here where I'm comfortable. Well, the pastor didn't do that. He went and he talked to them and he found out that they were going through a lot. The husband and wife were having marital issues. They were having financial issues. It was all sorts of bad things going on in their life. And so the husband, he, he asked, could he talk to the pastor by himself? And he sent his wife and his child off. And he said, I don't know why I came here today, pastor. It was just something inside me said that I should go here. And I'm going to be honest with you, Pastor, as I sat here and I, I looked at the congregation, I, I really was confused as to why God wanted me to be here because it didn't seem like anybody cared. And then you came and you talked to us and, and you paid attention to us. You, you basically loved us. And I'm, I'm really glad that you did that. 
He said, because to be totally honest with you, things had gotten so bad in my life that had I not had this conversation with you, my plan was to go home, to shoot my son and my wife, and then shoot myself. But I'm not going to do that now. You see what the cost of not doing what we need to do can be. Everybody was in their own little world. And there was somebody over in a corner that was hurting. But nobody paid any attention. We cannot do that. The cost is much too high. Jesus gave us the example. We show love, we show mercy, we show kindness to people regardless of what we can get in return. Favoritism, again, I'm showing you this kindness because I, of what I think I might get back. But as children of God, we do that and we don't expect anything in return. Because that's what Jesus did for us. Isn't it wonderful that as Jesus was walking up the Via Della Rosa, preparing to hang on the cross, he didn't say, I'm only doing this for Jews. You Gentiles, you're on your own. Isn't it wonderful that as Jesus was hanging there on the cross, he didn't say, I'm hanging here for the people who don't have money. Rich folks, worry about it yourselves. Isn't it wonderful that when he was hanging on the cross, he did not show favorites. He said, if you are born into this world, I am stretching my arms wide. I am hanging here for you and I'm giving you an opportunity for salvation. I'm not going to show favoritism to anyone. Isn't that wonderful? Our God doesn't have favorites. He's not a respecter of person. He doesn't love any one individual more than he loves another. And if we are going to imitate Christ, if we're going to live a life similar to his, then just as the pastor of that church said as he was leaving, you and I, we can't have favorites. God doesn't have favorites.